Hi, this is Pete Lyons with Let's Play Salesforce. And in tonight's Einstein Analytics video, we're going to talk about how to export full data sets as CSV. So just a quick disclaimer before anybody watches this video and realizes it's not complete. It's not complete. Uh, you are going to need to get with the developer to take this to the next level. While I'm able to fully go through the entire process in the UI uh, for anything more than a few thousand rows, it's really not scalable and you are going to need to automate the process. Additionally, this is only going to work if you have either Analytics Plus licenses or Einstein Discovery Legacy licenses. Uh, as this is necessary to be able to use the export transformation. That said, let's continue. Before we get into the how, we should talk about the why and the why not just a little bit. Uh, it's important to understand that the most common reason that business users will ask for full data set exports is so that they can dump their data into Excel where they're more comfortable with it. And uh, don't get me wrong, Excel is a wonderful tool. I use it all the time. I spent probably about four hours messing around with Excel today. Uh, but that does tend to hurt adoption and oftentimes what you should do is probe further and figure out well is it that you can't get the visualizations you need or that you just don't know how and a little bit of training on the compare table can go a long way so it's important to identify the real need before just saying oh yes we'll do that thing uh, next though let's talk about why we should we never want to treat Einstein Analytics as a data warehouse. And again, when we do start to you know, serve up all of these exports, we can start to walk down that path. But you know, what if we can't adhere to the best practice where any given data set can be restored from its data flow uh, and that data sets are always continually being purged and refreshed? What if we are snapshotting data? For example, maybe you have a trended report in analytics, or maybe you've built out a custom snapshot solution of your own, or even leveraged the new snapshotting template. Well, then you kind of don't really have a backup. So it's, it's not really so much the Salesforce side that I'm worried about. Uh, they've got geo-redundant backups. Uh, they're, they're pretty good about this sort of thing. I mean, they kind of have to be. Uh, it's really more about human error, and it's about best practice. You should always take a backup, and then you should backup that backup, and then you should backup both backups of the backup and put those in your backpack and take them somewhere safe. It, it, you never know um, if you let's say that you go to update something in your data flow and you accidentally break your snapshots well guess what they're not coming back you do have that restore data set functionality but what if you don't necessarily notice that you screwed it up until three or four or five refreshes down the line that data set restore functionality is only going to go back a couple of versions so it, if you can make a backup of this kind of data it's ideal to do so so best practice again Always make sure that your data sets can be recreated by the data flows that govern them, but uh, you know, and that any external data can be restored from the source. But if that isn't the case, then perhaps this solution is going to be right for you. So now let's jump into the fun part. How do we do this? So Tim Bizold recently published this document. Uh, it is not officially supported, so if it doesn't work, feel free to post on the community, but don't log a support ticket uh, because it's, again, it's not officially supported. But what this is actually driving off of is the original export node that was created to facilitate sharing data sets from Einstein Analytics to Einstein Discovery. This is no longer necessary as of winter 19, and while the exact nuances of how it works may not remain in place, uh, Tim has said that you know the forward-looking statement safe harbor is that we are going to be preserving and expanding on this functionality in the future so uh, What it actually does is when you run this transformation in your data set it or in your data flow It's going to create records in the objects data set export and data set export part one contains some you know metadata information about you know the, the, the files that are associated with it and then uh, the rest is part files chunked out into like 35 megabytes, I think, something like that. And so uh, this is going to persist for, uh, I think, like 24 or 48 hours. Um, so far, that's about what I'm observing. And uh, this is going to be how you're going to extract the data. And I'm going to show you two different ways to do this. So the first is going to be through Workbench. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to log in a Salesforce uh, in this org. And I'm going to just spit out a quick SQL query. So we can see that uh, I've been trying this a couple of times. I've got a few different records uh, in here. So I'm going to grab this first ID from the one I created a couple of days ago here. And then we're going to tweak our query ever so slightly. Okay. 
and now we actually see the uh, the individual file itself and all of our lovely data and yes uh, this single line of base 64 is our entire data set and don't give up yet I know this is a little laughable but we're getting there we're getting there and he actually does not recommend uh, that we do that this way so I'm gonna show you what, what Tim actually suggests and that is instead that we use a get call through the REST API. So that's broke this duplicate over here and we're gonna do, let's see, utilities, REST Explorer. I'm going to then put my uh, part ID in there. If I can get it on the clipboard, let's see what I got over here. Yeah, I'm gonna use the query editor as a notepad. So now we're gonna put that part ID into this instead. And so here's our actual raw response. And so we do get this nice side scrolly bit here. These are all of our column headers. And then here's our actual CSV file with all of our data in it. So uh, now, how do we export this as a CSV? Well, first, I'm gonna click here, and then I'm gonna do this for a while. Hang on, wait for it. It's only 7,000 rows. So from there, I was able to actually get the data into a text editor, save it as a CSV file, and then open it in Excel. So proof of, comp uh, proof of concept has been established, but I, I'm not really feeling that we're quite there yet. So it got me thinking, I'm looking at this uh, data file field, which is in base 64. So while it's heavily encoded, like this is just a ton and this is only 7,000 rows. So I needed to test it against something a little bit more robust. So what I did was I hopped into the data manager and I made this ugly little ladder here. So all I'm really doing is I'm getting my churn data and then I'm using compute expressions to clone it out 20 times. Then I append those together and then I clone that another 10 times. So for every row that I started with, I now have 200 rows and my 7,000 row data set is now up to about 1.4 million rows. And if we kind of step forward just a little bit, I got it loaded up right here. So if we take a look at that exports part files, we see we've got 13 different files in uh, 35 megabyte chunks. But it occurred to me, you know, hey, that's a field on an object. So I wonder if it's accessible to the data loader. And so that was my next line of attack. So now I've tweaked my query a little bit to grab the one that's got 1.4 million rows on it. And uh, I was able to successfully extract the one that only had 7,000 rows. And when I, was, when I grabbed the uh, data file field with that, I'm able to drop that into a base64 decoder. And if I just click to code, we do see that it does output the actual CSV file, which uh, you know might not be a pretty thing, but it does actually work. So this means that that field it does contain all of our data. So then I pop this into uh, a data loader query editor and uh, I just hit finish. And eventually it will get my file. Now we had 13 different chunks and supposedly these are 35 megabytes per chunk. So this is probably gonna take a bit, uh, but let's just sit back and see exactly how long this is gonna take us. So uh, I was actually really surprised at how quickly that downloaded enough that I didn't really think that I had gotten my data correctly. Uh, I'm gonna have to wait until I edit to see the exact time, but I should be showing it on the screen right about now. And it was a lot less time than I would have thought for a half a gig. And the, the next big challenge was just getting that to open in Excel. I actually had to disable uh, hardware acceleration in order for it to do this. So again, you know, we can just take this, uh, this raw response and we can copy it into our base 64 encoder. But again, this is not a scalable solution so far at high volume because I've also got like 17,000 rows of what I'm about to drop in here. 
And I'm not going to do this 17,000 times to back up one data set that's only got, uh, you know, 1.4 million rows in it. But it does, again, you know, it does spit out our CSV data. So, so far, things are actually looking extremely promising. But unfortunately, this is where we leave the realm of skills that I have, and we start to get to the point where I would need to work with uh, a teammate on this one. So I've got several different approaches that I think are viable, and I'd like to hear what you guys have to say in the comments. I think that the next step would either be to use SSIS to make a REST call and get the data, pull it down that way, and then parse through those CSVs that get downloaded, convert them from Base64 and into uh, actual CSV format for our files. Uh, or we could similarly uh, write a script for Windows PowerShell that we could do the same thing where we would call data loader command line. Uh, we would then download that, that same set of data. We would loop over the part files and use the PowerShell functionality to uh, decode the Base64 into something that's actually usable. And then we also need to take into consideration how are we going to schedule this? How are we going to maintain this? How are we going to prevent errors from happening? So at this stage, I think we've really achieved a proof of concept that says, yes, we can actually do this. And these are the directions that we need to go and think in. But for the rest of that, I leave it up to you. So if you enjoyed this video, uh, please like, subscribe, and tell a friend. But as always, thanks for watching.